Well, hello, everyone. My name is Michael Cadera, and welcome to orchestrating an OpenStack-based IoT smart home. Now, I am, uh, I consider myself lucky. I really get to, to help people deploy cloud and data center applications. And as part of that, what I do is I work in Intel's open source technology center. And when I work with customers, I leverage a lot of what I've done in the past in working with Intel's IT department. And so, for example, I used to deploy a lot of their cloud environments as well as platform as a service and applications as a service. And I rely on that history as well as working with great people like Leong and John who are actually working within the community as well as on our platforms to make OpenStack and cloud services a lot easier to use. And that's a lot about what we'll be talking about today. My name is John Geyer. Um, I've been working in data centers and labs and different spaces like that for 20 some odd years. Uh, most of those have been at Intel. Um, so my history is, is basically, in the, basically in the trenches. Uh, I didn't do a whole lot of customer interaction, um, although here and there, a few years here, a few years there, I did do some. Um, but in that time, um, I've had a lot of experience with uh, Intel hardware from the ground up and alpha and beta stages and, and everything from uh, mobiles all the way through uh, uh, servers. So um, as I'm in this role, and, and I actually report to Mike, um, moving more into the community and uh, looking forward to doing a lot more of this. Hi, I'm, I'm Leon. I'm a senior software cloud architect for Intel as well. So we are in the same open source technology center. Um, I actually joined Intel last year, so I'm pretty young to Intel compared to them, more, than, more years than me in Intel. But before that, I have been working in the industry for more than 15 years. Um, I have got a chance to work on different kind of applications, including peer-to-peer -peer application, peer-to-peer -peer application, media streaming applications, and also in the academic research as well. So I completed my PhD in 2013. Um, my PhD is about multi-cloud multi orchestrations. And I'm so actively involved in the enterprise working group. Um, so in, in the past two years, we delivered two e-books that talk about how to, what is OpenStack and how to, how to implement OpenStack in an enterprise context. And in the upcoming Friday, um, we are going to do a third e-book. And I see my fellow contributors here as well. <laughs> and um, the third e-book basically talk about how to build applications that run on top of OpenStack. Moving forward, so today what we're going to do is we want to start by demonstrating an IoT use case that we created that's actually an IoT smart home. And in this demonstration, we'll show a number of different devices all connecting and working together, not only locally and managing that with uh, the local analytics as well as the RESTful interface, but how we're going to be able to communicate with that and manage those solutions in the cloud. Now, as we go through this, what we'll do is I'll walk through the, the demo environment and how we set it up and why, as well as uh, John and Leong will finish things off by looking at specifically what OpenStack can do for your cloud environment and how it can actually enable IoT applications. And then they'll wrap things up with some data analytics. Now, our customers are really going to demand a lot of our cloud. When you really start thinking about what's coming with the number of IoT devices, 50 billion is what I've seen projected by 2020, and how this data will really impact our entire environments. Now, in 2008, there was a, a, an event that went kind of a, not necessarily unrecognized, but I think unnoticed by a number of people. And really what happened at that point is that was the point that we had more things, more phones, more connected sensors and devices on the network than we had people using them. That was a, a report that was given by Cisco back in 2008, I believe it was called Internet of Things, simply enough. Now, start looking at where we're going. Now, you look at uh, the example here we have with people. And you now we're all techies, I don't think a gig and a half of tra internet traffic a day necessarily sounds so big for us, but I gotta tell you, if I start applying that thought to what my mom might be doing on the internet, that's quite a lot 
and you start thinking about how much data is coming from people, on the average, that is a lot. Now, that's up from 650 meg of last year, so we're probably just a little bit over that. Now, definitely a decent amount of information, but now let's start looking towards machines and what we're doing there. Smart hospitals, you know, they'll definitely be generating a lot of information with 3,000 gig a day. But self-driving cars, you think about, it's basically a data center on wheels with some of the stuff that they're doing. You know, you have to have really detailed analytics to know that there are hazards in front of you or all the cameras and processing that has to happen quite a lot that has to happen within that and also processing at the edge versus in the cloud. Connected planes, of course, numerous sensors. I'm not a pilot, so I can't go into all the details there, but a lot definitely going on there. And then factories. This is just amazing, one million gigabits a day. A day. Now really, you start looking at all of that and all the machine communication. And part of the projection here is that machine-to-machine -machine traffic is projected to be about 40% of the internet traffic by 2020. So truly, I guess that's the start of the rise of the machines. <laughs> now, we do have a demo here. I think I'll actually go through. I'll unveil our surprise for you. This is a example environment we set up yeah, so you have to imagine this is where we actually keep our, our most promising developers. Um, it's a five million house. Yes, that's right. <laughs> we have a number of different sensors all included in here. Everything from motion sensors, it's over here. I think it's actually detecting motion in the front, but it, it triggers our LED lights from uh, red to blue. Um, we also have temperature sensors, a number of things in here, and are actually controlling this using um, what's called IOTivity. And IOTivity is a, uh, basically what it does is it provides device discovery of a mix of different environments. So if you can imagine, all of these temperature sensors, um, we have a CO2 sensor, are all, being, are all manufactured by a range of device manufacturers. Now, what I'm able to do is through IOTivity and through open standards, we're actually able to bring these all together. So if you can imagine some of the challenges that many of our developers have with IoT devices and solutions. You have a great smart TV, then I've got a wonderful smart thermostat. Well, I can't control my thermostat through my TV. You know, I'd like to have that all working together, but now I have to work and make some bridging information. But, you know, I have a, a simple application that we created on our Android device. You know, it allows me to turn on, um, you know, we've got a, a buzzer here. You know, that you can actually hear going off, and that's basically also, a, it's connected to a CO2 alarm that we'll also, also turn off, and that actually triggers some simple analytics with a fan venting the environment. Now, of course, this isn't to scale, but all of this is a set design to help give people an idea. And the reason why we built this was really to start to show how data starts to flow from these individual devices, how you can control them on the edge, and also how you're going to manage data, not only here locally, but in the cloud. Now, let me show you a little bit more about how the architecture looks. go. So this is the overall architecture. I mentioned IOTivity is really the center point of how we're communicating. Now, within the environment, we have Ostro. Ostro is a Yocto-based Linux distro that, that was created, and we're at, that's what's running on our gateway. That's a minnow board max. You may be actually seeing our solar panels tilting based on the time of day, and it just, uh, just moved. So um, we also have Zephyr, which is a real-time operating system, so uh, that's what's powering our smart meter. And then on the cloud, this is where we have OpenStack, and that is orchestrating our Cloud Foundry environment and also big data analytics. Now, what I'd like to show you is switching to our cloud. Now, a bit of a warning here, because of um, connectivity issues we had with just being able to get our gateway to connect to an external IP and communicating with our cloud. What we're doing is we're sending example data to our cloud. So this gateway is not directly connected. So we set up a container that is simulating the uh, data here that you're able to see. So before you laugh at some of the things in there, you'll see maybe a little bit of an odd temperature in that house, but uh, it's all here just to show you the examples and how it all comes together. Now, I mentioned that we are using Cloud Foundry. 
And as an example here, what we did is we created this, I can this show pretty well, but you can see it's a little blurry up there. But we have right now five instances deployed all behind that, that URL that you see here. And that's very easy for us to rapidly scale this. We just tell it the number of instances we want to deploy. It goes out and provisions those solutions and load balances all of that behind our environment. So that is one of the things by developing this application to use Cloud Foundry, we're able to take advantage of quick deployment, easily scaling that solution. Now we've also created this so it can work in containers as well. So we can be pretty versatile, versatile in allowing others, if they don't have a Cloud Foundry setup, to also test it and play around with it in a container setup. Now part of the data that we're bringing together, you can see um, some simple um, warnings that we have based on motion and, uh, and uh, CO2 alerts, so we're able to track that. But we're also bringing in additional information with, uh, I can scroll down, unfortunately. I just press it down. Yeah, I think I'll have to just, there we go. So you can see a little bit more of the information we're tracking. Um, we're doing some simple analytics here that uh, based on the weather locally. And uh, if you adjust the thermostat based on power consumption, of course, it is a little warm in that house, so. Um, <laughs> Wonder what uh, the temperature is it's when you about need to 3, boil. 3,000 Fahrenheit. 3,000 plus Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit. So I had to convert that for me. Thank you. <laughs> so um, you can see that we're tracking some of the information there. But now um, switching to some of the historical information, this is where things start to get a little bit more interesting. Um, so we have historical information on the past month and and uh, the last year. And this is what I really wanted to show is what we're storing here in the cloud. It's that historical information and data retention so you can do that more detailed analytics. So when I start looking at it from one single house, and now if we start to scale this out to, you know, if we wanted to look at it from, you know, maybe I'm managing a number of homes from a, uh, a neighborhood or a grid, in, for example. Now, we have a couple of these, uh, these environments set up, one that's running right now in, uh, in Asia. But uh, let me bring up ours in Barcelona. And you can see our environment here. And what we have is this is uh, representing the gateway that we have right here and some of the historical information. And now what we've done here is we've provided example data that would have, that's based on the analytics that we're collecting that is showing some of the warnings that you have. So you can actually go in and manage other homes and actually start to have projections on data consumption. If you're looking, if you're managing grid, you can actually start to understand how your solar and uh, grid energy can, uh, can impact your, your solution. So um, just to kind of overview of the whole interface and the things that we can get from Cloud Foundry and easily deploying our environment. So, all right. Now, I showed you the application on our Android. Of course, that's a little bit hard to see from there, but uh, we have simple controls locally. But let's start looking at the application profile. And I think you'll see initially there are some things that are very common to cloud applications, but looking at a few other things on what's, what might be a little bit different with IoT applications. So behavior of steady and predictable, I think we've all seen applications like that. It'd be great if every application operated that way, but not all IoT does. Now we have to look at, of course, the growth and projection of that. IoT devices are so sometimes so simple to deploy that they, I, really that high growth is a really big potential within your environment, and you really need to plan for that. Now, also, one of the characteristics of IoT solutions is that they're not always connected. Sometimes they're on, sometimes they're off. If you have, for example, a shipping application and they're going through the mountains, you need to know what's, what you need to track and resync that data or even back it up and, and bring everything back online. How does that all work within your environment? You need to plan for that and potentially do analytics at different areas to make sure that things stay within plan. And then overall bursting, you know, a periodic bursting, that's great. You know, you can easily plan for it, but uh, random bursting is really difficult to plan for. And so you need to, of course, work within your resources to make sure you can scale. Maybe you're gonna implement a hybrid cloud solution to help with that bursting external. Now I think a lot of people are familiar with microservices, though, you know, especially from a cloud perspective, but I think looking at it from a IoT 
and inclusive of IoT devices changes things just a little bit because a lot of times I think developers aren't thinking it from the full end to end. So application services completely apply to that and how you bring everything together. But collection orchestration, you know, of course within the cloud you're going to have things like Chef, Puppet, uh, Ansible, um, solutions like that, that heat templates that can help you with uh, collection orchestration. But you also need to consider how you're going to manage your individual services at the gateway level. Our gateway, we actually are, are doing some simple analytics there, but it, it's easy. This actually has plenty of horsepower that we can run containers on there and easily switch out services and upgrade them easily. But that would be a big part of continuous integration and development. Growth and scalability is also a big part of it and just making sure you're ready. So if you're scaling up, one of the things, of course, you always have to think about is always it starts with the database and making sure everything is ready. Potentially, you may need that N plus one environment to make sure that when you scale out that application and that database, that it's ready, the data is ready for other applications or web services and caching services to connect to it. The life cycle. Of course, I think a lot of people are familiar with all the work that the OpenStack community has been doing with upgrades and managing APIs, but you do know the challenges that goes with that. You need to make sure of that across the board of all your devices. How are you going to perform these upgrades? Do you need to, act, you don't want to have to go in and rip out a device from a wall or the floor or potentially have to swap out something in your car because you want to, you want to patch that environment. You need to be able to consider that within your plans as well. And we talked a little bit about continuous integration and, de and deployment. You need to, of course, include those devices in your plan. Oh, I, you know, there's so much going on right now with that internet storm. Does anybody have a web camera on them that's uh, been hacked? <laughs> there's been so much going on. You know, it's, it's really a, kind of a nice, the, the better half of this, it it's really applies well to my uh, slide right here. Not only do you have to think about user authentication, but who is actually accessing those devices? What devices are attaching to your environment? So, uh, of course, the lesson learned, make sure you change default passwords, do intrusion detection, things like that all need to be considered. But of course, network encryption and data encryption. You know, when I left my house, one of the things that's really nice, it's kind of a surprise earlier today, I actually have a few IoT devices, but one of the reasons why I set it up was that my kids kept on leaving my garage door open. So I don't want all those tools that I have in my house walking off, so I get alerts when my garage door has been open, so I'm able to actually close my garage door from the other side of the world. So, but I don't want to have, give that, to, that key to my neighbors. So making sure that that's good and secure, or providing those updates that um, I'm the one that, that uh, announces to who that I'm out of town and that, uh, whether or not my house is unlocked or not. So patching, of course, just as simple of other things, you have to look at that from a security perspective. How are you going to patch and, and, and uh, keep those, all those devices current? Now, I'd like to change the, the, really the look now to how we manage data and where you're gathering it. Because really IoT brings more options for you with data gathering, but really looking at it from, we all know what we can do with big data analytics really in the cloud, you get that deep compute, deep analytics, deep, you know, a lot of historical data, but you also have benefits within IoT devices and they're getting strong and you can do some analytics there. You need to take advantage of that. And this is, uh, speaking of that, this is a great slide that uh, Tom Bradich, he's uh, with HP, he provided a presentation on this earlier in uh, the year. And, allowed us to use this slide, but it's a good example of really showing that, that spectrum of insight when you're looking at where data analytics can happen. And as it says on the title, location can be everything. Because, you know, if I have a, a car that's noticing that there's a truck driving in front of it, I don't want to have to communicate that it just recognized the truck is in there. I better send that off to the cloud for analysis. And meanwhile, my car just continues to barrel into it. You need to have that local analytics and the power and horsepower behind that to make sure it can make those quick response, quick action um, decisions at that time. But looking at what we can do, start from the cloud, and of course you have the ability to store lots amount of data and bring in a lot more 
integrated data into that solution and do that combined analytics. Now, there are trade-offs there because not everybody's going to have the power that a lot of those autonomous, autonomous cars have in the environment. You're going to have to do trade-offs and, and what you can and can't do at the edge, but there are some strong devices. I mean, for example, you know, the thermostat on this is uh, not changing. It's probably, you know, around uh, 20 degrees or so. And, uh, you know, I don't need to send three updates a second to the cloud. That's just noise. You know, or if I'm driving my car and I'm collecting tire pressure, I don't want to have to store a data array in my garage just to keep track of all that tire pressure. I just want some updates. But I do want to actually know that, you know what, the performance of my car has shifted out of normal. I want to be able to track that information locally or potentially even have more, more of a range to, to potentially warn me of, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, but potentially warn me of maybe a failure in one of the devices that, is, that could potentially be happening. So there is that trade-off of compute, and you'll see that you can actually leverage more and more the more you shift to the left and start looking at some of the analytics and leverage both ends of the spectrum for the capabilities that they provide. So let's take a look at this from, from the top down. Um, we've talked a lot about what can be happening and how all this works, and let's, let's look at, by layer, how this all stacks together and, and becomes something that's actually usable. Uh, with IoT devices and applications, uh, you can be talking about a lot of different things. I mean, you could have someone in a vineyard somewhere who wants to measure water uh, in the soil, nutrients in the soil, the thickness of a stem so that he can produce a better uh, grape for wine by controlling how much sugar is there. Um, from an environmental uh, perspective, maybe we measure chemicals and run off into rivers and streams so that we can track where maybe we've got some issues and we can maybe save a few fish. Um, athletes can be tracked as far as stats. You can then maintain a healthier uh, athlete, better team. Um, and then in this case, you know, we're tracking a lot of data and what, what are we going to do with this data? How do we get it to the cloud? And what do we do with it once we get it there? Um, so as this data is collected, uh, we need to move it somewhere. And these applications have to run somewhere, but the application designer doesn't want to have to deal with infrastructure, doesn't want to have to deal with, well, you know, I mean, how much hard drive space am I going to need? What, what do we do here? So we give a layer um, where things like platform as, as a service, big data, containers, VMs, all that can live where the application designer and owner only has to work in that space. and They don't have to work beyond that space. You know, they, they have someone else to take care of it because it's all deployed somewhere off, off their premises in the cloud. Um, so there's a lot of things that can fit in here. Uh, cloud Foundry, Hadoop, um, Docker. Uh, you can have multiple different kinds of VMs, whether they're uh, running straight up on, on a cluster, one little machine that has several VMs, lots of different things that can happen. But what do we do with all those, right? Because all of those work great, but they really don't work great on their own. So in order to support those applications, we need something that's more of a infrastructure uh, as a service. And that's where OpenStack really starts to come in and play, because here we've got something that's, that's scalable, it's dependable, it's uh, consistent, um, and it's, it's able to handle a lot of different kinds of things. We can have all these different uh, platform as a service items running on it. We can have all these uh, VMs running in different private spaces. We can have bare metal sitting off to the side where someone needs raw hardware power and doesn't want to share with their neighbors. Um, so as, as we put all this together, there's a lot of different ways to deploy OpenStack as well. And, and that can get into a pretty long talk, but uh, you know, there's different things where you can use, you can use Marantis Fuel, uh, Red Hat's um, RDO. Um, you can go a little more hardcore and try with DevStack and have fun with that, but if you really want to punish yourself, try to do it from the command line, line by line, and that's, that's a project by itself. Um, but all these things, oops, all these things really stack up to a I just lost my, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there we go. going the other way. Damn it. Yeah. Still 
All these things all stack up to a lot of software, but what do you do for the hardware? And that's where a big question comes in. And most people from the application end are gonna just pay someone to take care of that. But what if you're the guy that has to sit there and actually build this hardware? And this, this conversation can go a long time, and there's a lot of different factors in you know, uh, how, how much data we're we gonna use, how, you know, how much processing power is this gonna take, how much power are we gonna burn, what do we do to cool it? Um, we did a session in Austin, and there's, we have a, a backup slide here at the end with some information where you can link right to this. But we actually did a whole session on building a flexible uh, uh, OpenStack cloud from the ground up, where we talk about what it takes to design the space, what it takes to figure out what kind of hardware we're gonna need, you, do you need to be scalable, are you gonna be just a little unit, and, and all this stuff. And you can go through all of these things, but what it comes down to is we selected OpenStack because it worked so well for everything that we needed to do. We want the flexibility to add, have Cloud Foundry. We want the, the flexibility to add something from another vendor. We want the ability to run some containers. We want some bare metal hardware on the side. Uh, we want a bunch of VMs, and all this stuff can either interact or be in its own space. And OpenStack will provide all of that in one big platform. So as we look at that, so some of the platform was as a service options. Uh, Cloud Foundry, this is, this is an industry standard, and it's kind of a, kind of a one-off all on its own because it's, it's hard to understand how it actually works, but it really does provide a buffer from both sides, from the application engineer and from the hardware, and it interfaces with all of these things kind of blindly and is capable of handling all these other industry standard connections. But once you set up in Cloud Foundry, if you have to move to another data center, you pick up and you move and you redeploy Cloud Foundry, and all your stuff just kind of fits right back in there. Uh, OpenShift is another um, platform as a service that's, that's an interesting one. Um, Cloud Foundry and OpenShift are both end-to-end, -end, so they, they handle uh, everything from development to deployment, all the debug in the middle, and all that kind of stuff. OpenShift is, is a uh, Red Hat, oops, Red Hat component, and um, it's built on top of uh, Docker and um, Kubernetes. Uh, Juju, I thought about not having it in this list um, because it really isn't a platform as a service, but with the introduction of the charms that go with it, this is a, this is a um, um, canonical product um, that is also based on Kubernetes. With the charms, that you do have some orchestration, so we left it in this list as platform as a service. So there's, there's a bunch of these, and you can kind of go and pick and choose and, and decide what they all are, and they'll all work on OpenStack. Uh, containers is another one, and there's been a lot of talk of containers over, over the last few years. Uh, these summits are full of them. Um, this, is, this is an interesting option that allows you to package applications and all the dependencies in a neat little package, and then just start deploying them and scaling them and moving them around, and they just kind of plug in wherever you need them. Um, so that's all great, but these items don't run so well without, uh, without something else underneath them. Uh, infrastructure as a service solves a lot of that. With VMs, um, we do traditional VMs, you've got, you can use uh, several different uh, tenants on one piece of hardware, um, and then everybody splits it up and gets a piece of it, and then it'll use your hardware better, but your performance may not be as good. So in some cases, people are gonna want bare metal, where you put one tenant, they have all access to all the hardware, but the efficiency isn't there. So <clears throat> with all that said, let me restate, OpenStack was the direction we went with this project because of the fact that we can now build this application in many different forms or in one form that'll fit into several different holes. Um, and as we go along, um, you'll see, and many of you already know, that OpenStack provides something that that's, it's hard to quantify in how much does it cover because so far we can kind of throw everything we want at it and it'll run all this stuff and it'll orchestrate all this stuff together so that your user base doesn't have to see all the mess behind the the, the lines, and, and uh, from the hardware end, um, building, building your cluster, uh, you, you're able to scale and flex and add pieces, subtract pieces, and bring in pieces that, that are brand new and, and new to the whole entire scheme. So with that, I wanna turn this over to Leon. So um, I think just now John mentioned Mike as well mentioned about different options that we can use to build the backend cloud to do all the processing stuff. So we use this as example here to show you guys. Um, it's basically using a cloud foundry deployment or so OpenStack. 
So um, if you want to deploy Cloud Foundry on OpenStack, so these are the few things that is a pointer. So these are the few things that you need to be concerned with when you try to build uh, Cloud Foundry on OpenStack. So you really have to make sure that um, all your OpenStack instances um, from an OpenStack API perspective, you have to verify that your OpenStack API credentials and can make API calls to your OpenStack instances. And you have to ensure that all your VMs can access to all the metadata meta services. And also need to make sure that all the VM in between need to be able to ping from each other. And also the volumes, the, the center volume, you need to verify that you can really mount a volume from the VM. And you have to also need to be sure that you can upload or deploy. Uh, for this case, you're using Ubuntu 14.04 Cloud Images. And because of all those um, security able to, um, for the VM able to communicate with each other, um, you may have to make sure you, you set up your security, group, security groups correctly by, putting, by configuring all the ingress and, and egress filter. And also you have to make sure that DNS is working for in this environment as well. So these are all the things that you need to be aware of when it comes to deploy uh, Cloud Foundry on OpenStack. So this, on the other hand, here is basically the Cloud Foundry ar architecture. And anyone use Cloud Foundry before? Yeah, I know you should. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so these are the generic architectures that you can use. So Cloud Foundry really works very well on the OpenStack Cloud environment. And I think in this demo, we did actually, as Mike, Mike, Mike has mentioned, uh, this was deployed using Cloud Foundry on top of OpenStack. So next thing I want to talk about is the data processing model, which is more on the IoT analytics side. So um, with all the IoT data is coming in, um, there are basically three way of uh, process data processing model that we can look at. So first thing is um, what we call a batch processing model. So in a batch processing model, uh, this kind of analytics basically based on the historical data, uh, it can be your operational data, or you can also draw uh, or link information or data from um, your enterprise, service, uh, enterprise system or even the social media. And then you, have, you can use this model to process the IoT data which is coming in and you store those IoT data in some data stores and then later on you can do the batch processing and integrating them with your existing um, enterprise data or social media data and, gen and generate a, a kind of like a static, view, static view of the report so they can do some analysis. So this is the very first um, a batch processing model that you can do in IoT analytics works. The second thing is about what we call a real-time streaming. So in the real-time streaming, as the, as the name sh shows, um, basically allow us to do um, real-time analysis. So in the, in, this is what we call a stream processing model. The data is continuously, continuously streamed and directly analyzed at real time. So in this model, your actions can be triggered in case of some occurrence of a specific events. So in the IoT examples, um, if you're using a smart home, as uh, Mike just now mentioned, if somebody open up your garage, you can immediately trigger those alert and send those alert to, your, to the cloud and then notify you through, through any of the uh, SMS or, or, or mobile, mobile notification systems. So that's one example. And other use cases of IoT apart from smart home, other IoT use cases, example, can be like credit card analysis, analysis, analysis or fault detection. So that, those can be used as well. So the, the streaming processing, real-time pro streaming processing model, it allows you to do real-time event-based analytics. And the other model that we want to talk about is what we call predictive processing. So predictive processing basically, as the name says, it predicts the outcome based on the most recent and historical data. So this model basically is used to predict the future uh, outcome, the possible outcome or behavior or any other action that you want to perform in the future. Uh, and in this analytic model, we generally uh, require some uh, to program some predictive algorithms in your application. And so one example that we can think of is, um, for example, doing some predictive maintenance in a, for example, let's say you do a, a IoT devices in the manufacturing um, uh, use cases. Every manufacturing machines can have IoT data being sent over to your cloud and do predictive analysis. 
So those data came coming from the machines or from the engines for all the sensors. You collect it and analyze them, analyze them so that you can do perform some predictive at, um, actions. For example, you can recommend when is the next back, when is the best time to do the next maintenance cycle before a potential failure can happen in your factory. So these are basically a tree processing data processing model that we can use uh, when coming to IoT analytics use cases. So having understand the processing model, um, I still have time, right? Yeah. So having uh, understand the data processing model, um, how, go, how are we going to process those, those, uh, uh, the, those data? So a common use case, a common example or application that we can use here is Hadoop. I believe most of you understand Hadoop. Um, anyone doesn't understand, uh, uh, does not know about Hadoop architectures? No, everyone knows? Okay, only a few of them. So basically, this is a very generic architecture from a Hadoop perspective. So in the Hadoop environment, you basically have this name node, which is in the master clusters. The name node basically um, store the metadata about the data, and it provides some lookup functionality or tracking where the data and files are in the Hadoop clusters. The name node, the name node itself doesn't store the actual data. It generally uh, the name node basically generally requires high memory or RAM allocation, and, and, and most of the processing tasks are being done at the data node. So the data node at the bottom belongs to the so-called slave architectures. It is a worker node that do all the responsible for storing and compute all the data, and it responds back to the name node for the file system operations. And the name node, uh, the data node generally requires high amount of storage space or the CPU processing, uh, CPU processing. So that is a standard Hadoop architecture. And I believe you, if you still remember the keynote that we mentioned about the workload reference architectures. So we work, I, I work very closely with the enterprise working group. So this is one of the, one of the example Hadoop architecture in a simple clusters that you can do with the open stack. So as John mentioned, you want to make these infrastructures Flexible. You want to run Cloud Foundry. You want to run Hadoop. You probably want to do some application running on container or VM. And OpenStack really provide a very powerful platform to allow you to run multiple options to support your developer needs. So in, for the Hadoop case, um, or the, if you're interested, you can find out more information from here about how we, we can deploy Hadoop using OpenStack. So with that, I just pass over to Sure. Mike. Okay. Um, we're kind of bringing things together, really, uh, looking at what is different from IoT applications. Now, it does have a lot of the cloud characteristics that we're familiar with, but there are some things that really need to be considered. As Leong has shown, there's a lot of different approaches towards data analytics, but really where is that data collected and where do you need to make decisions on that data. Is it it's quick decisions, things like that, you may want to pr push that more towards the edge or have the compute power with you at the edge versus the deep and detailed analytics that you would have in the cloud. Of course, you're gonna balance that control depending on where that location is and uh, all the other pieces that come into that with scaling of these applications. That's why the benefits of a platform as a service solution like Cloud Foundry come into play and provide that scalability for you. In the end, you really need to know your requirements of your applications. I don't think that's anything new with anything we've all been doing and deploying applications from many, many years, but just they are a little bit different, and knowing how connectivity works is a big part of it. And so loss of connectivity is not an issue. It's just sometimes part of the way those applications operate. We need to plan for it. Design for failure. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So in bringing things together, we could only skim the surface on everything that is involved with this demo all the way up to the cloud. And so what we've done is we have a white paper that is available on 01.org. It's um, Intel's open source site, but there's a QR code. You can go ahead and look at it. It actually links to the Git repo where you can actually download. This is all open source, every bit of it, even the, the code we deployed. So you can actually deploy it and play with it and uh, have fun in the IoT environment. And so um, IoTivity, there's also additional links there. That is a Linux Foundation project. So that's completely available. Um, over 200 companies all working together to create these, these standards within the environment. 
So with that, um, thank you for joining us, and we'll open it up to questions. You only have 30 seconds left. Wow. <laughs> How's that for timing? Yes. using IPv6? IPv6? Um, not no, not within that environment. The question is if we're using IPv6 in our environment, but we're not. Um, and uh, we haven't tested to that level, but uh, let me ask, answer the other question of why Cloud Foundry was necessary for IoT. Really, it was for the platform as a service. It wasn't specifically that we had to use Cloud Foundry. We could have used Kubernetes or Docker Swarm or other Rocket or kinds of solutions that help us with containers. But what Cloud Foundry and other PaaS solutions do is they provide, similar to what we're, in, we're very used to with infrastructure as a service, of ex exposing that infrastructure as an API and how IOTivity exposes all these devices and does a device discovery and manages it through an a, a RESTful API. Same thing with pushing your code. All I have to do is just push my code using that API and I can rapidly scale it and, um, and manage that environment so much easier. You know, I don't have to worry about the individual, I need to deploy a LAMP stack, I need to do all the security and pen testing. A lot of times you can go through and validate that within your, your so past So the stack. example that we show here, basically we, we just use Cloud Foundry as one of the solutions. You are free to use any other options, including Redshift or any other. Oh, it all depends on how you develop your applications, right? You need to write the application to support IoT use cases. You can develop, you can de develop your application in the microservices way on container, and which also can be run on OpenStack. You also can be deploy those microservices in VM without using any of the past layers. That's all up to your developer choices. So what we're trying to say here in the presentation is having OpenStack as underlying platforms, you can support different type of options that best suit your developers so that you can deliver the software faster and easier to support IoT use cases. That's not something specific to IoT. Yeah. No, 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 it's really, it's, yeah. a, it's a matter of choice. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Sahara recently you have used OpenStar Sahara for use case? Oh, Sahara. Uh, Sahara. I think when, at the time when this project was started, the Sahara is not mature enough to for us to test it. That's why we run, out, run the own, our own Hadoop clusters on it. So definitely, yes, Sahara is another project that you can look at when it comes to big data processing. All right. yeah. So in that case, uh, if you have a deployment with Sahara on it, then you would need to have Cloud Forms or OpenShift okay. or Shushu. Exactly. That's correct. That's right. OK, thank you. So use OpenStack. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, everyone. And if you have any other questions, just feel free to come up and join us. Thank you. Yeah.